morning, Terry Rowe. <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> These are our announcements for today. At 1.30, we have adult choir rehearsal. And then on Tuesday at 11 a.m., we have our men's prayer group meeting. And at 12.15 p.m., we have our brown bag Bible study. Then on Wednesday, we have our midweek encouragement that is released online at approximately 12 o'clock. Following that, we have Bible study at 5.30 p.m. And do excuse me, I am trying to catch my breath. <laughs> on Saturday, we have our basketball ministry that meets from 10 to 4 p.m. And then following that, alongside of that, we have our noonday prayer. New ministry. We have a new ministry today at Actually, that's um, next Saturday. The men's and women's ministry meets every other Sunday. And so that's an update to that announcement that I shouldn't get into for this. My apologies. Uh, but it is a new ministry. Uh, Jody Pugh will be leading the women and Jeff Pugh will be leading the men. Uh, the women will be in the new fellowship hall and the men will meet in the sanctuary. And this is open to everyone as far as a men and women's group meeting. Homecoming. Homecoming is set for October the 16th. RSVP to the church office if you plan to come and you plan to eat since it will be catered. It is $7 per adult and $3 per child for dinner's barbecue and sides. For your convenience, there is a form in your bulletin today. All right, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you so very much for your spirit, power, and anointing. We do pray today that you would allow your spirit to fill this service. God, in return, we will give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Y'all good this morning? Amen. I see smiles. I like it. I like it. All right, let's stand up and let's sing together this morning. We're going to start off with a favorite, Amazing Grace. And we're going to sing all 500 verses because they're awesome.
joyous sound this morning. Let's continue that sound with Be Thou My Vision. Thank you. 
stand with me if you will for the reading of scripture. Today's scripture reading will be quite extensive, so if any time you feel the need to sit down, you may sit. Our scripture will be coming from Luke 15, verses 11 through 24, and I'll be reading from the New International Version. All together, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the paws that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick! Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. All right. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Great worship set and gracious, great reading of Scripture. You know, I really appreciate you reading Scripture aloud with us. Uh, I, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I grew up doing that. And, of course, at that time, we didn't have screens, but everybody had a King James Bible, right? And so it made a difference. It made it a lot easier because everything was... Everything was the same for everybody. And uh, with, with all of our different versions and varieties today, it makes it more difficult. But praise God for the screens. Amen. 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 And uh, uh, I, I am grateful, grateful for that. So today we're, we're looking at the third parable here in Luke 15, the lost son. And uh, this, is, this is, of course, the, the most familiar of the parables um, and and uh, you know it, it's it's familiar to us not only from reading the scriptures but familiar to us as well because most of us have lived out either one side of the prodigal son or the other side for those of us who are extremely talented we've lived out both sides Right? We've been on both ends of the stick. And so we can identify so clearly and so quickly with Jesus' teaching here in this, in this parable. Um, we'll start off with, a, with a, a, a quote from Dr. David Considine, who's a professor at Folsom Lake College in Florida. And he said, it's our self-importance not our misery that gets in God's way. 
It's our self-importance that gets in God's way. Misery doesn't get in God's way. But when we think we're more than what we actually are, that gets in God's way. And this young son, uh, this young son felt that way. He felt like he was more important than his brother or his father. Uh, we're not told of anybody else who was in the home, but maybe there were, maybe there weren't. But he, he made an arrogant demand, an arrogant request of his father right there in verse 12. And Jesus starts off this parable by, by, by setting the scene for a major display of God's immeasurable grace, right? A display of God's immeasurable grace. The prodigal son here represents the, the, the sinners and the tax collectors. You recall it in chapter 14, Jesus had, was teaching in a house and teaching to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were arguing back and forth with Jesus and with no air conditioning. The windows were open and so a crowd of sinners and tax collectors had, had uh, gathered on the outside to listen to this exchange. And so the, the prodigal represents those tax collectors and sinners and ultimately represents us, right? Just as we've already talked about. He made an arrogant demand. He said, Dad, give me what's mine and I give it to me now. We want what we want and we want it when we want it, right? That's, that's part of living in the 21st century. We want what we want and we want it right now, if not yesterday. Immediately, if not sooner. And that's not always the way God works, is it? Not at all. Not at all. Matthew Henry, the, the commentator, wrote, and I want to read this so I don't mess it up. He said, the great folly of sinners is being content to have their share in hand now in this lifetime to receive their good things. They only look to things that are seen and covet only a present enjoyment but have no care about a future happiness. And you know, we live in a microwave generation. You know, why is it taking, why is it taking 30 seconds for this meal to heat up? You know, I, it, 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 it took us, it took our grandparents three hours to cook that. And we get, we get antsy because it takes 30, 45 seconds. Well, that's just not healthy. <laughs> that's not healthy. We have to learn to slow down and we have to, to, to be patient with what God's trying to teach us. Think back on Solomon's, Solomon's wisdom in Proverbs chapter 30 where he said in verses 8 and 9, he said, keep falsehood and lies. Keep falsehood and lies away from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much. Disown God and say, who's God? Or I may become poor and steal. And by doing that, I dishonor God's name. So Solomon is telling us here what this boy didn't want to hear. He didn't want to be content with where he was. He had heard about the wild life. He had heard about the city life. He was a country boy, and he wanted some of that. And so, <coughs> pardon, he demanded from Daddy, give me my share of the inheritance now. And, you know, while riches and nice things, material goods are not in and of themselves intrinsically wrong, 
The love of them is. The love of those things is. Paul wrote to Timothy in his first letter. He said, people who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And so throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, God warns us about being <laughs> impatient. He warns us about a desire to be rich. He, he warns us about the desire to have stuck keeping up with the Joneses or the Smiths or the Browns or the Yango bitches or whoever lives next door to you. Right? He warns us about those things for good reason. <clears throat> and so we see the son's arrogant request. And then those were followed by repulsive actions. Repulsive actions. <clears throat> the son, the younger son, got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. King James says riotous living. Right? After he had spent everything there, uh, everything, there became uh, a, a severe famine in the whole country. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him into his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. And no one gave him anything. Now you, 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 have, to, you have to see here God's sense of humor. Here was this good Jewish boy. He had never eaten pork. He had never been around pigs. He had been clean his whole life. And now he had wasted everything that God had provided for him through his daddy. And he's sitting in a pig lot in the mud fighting with the pigs for their food out of the slop bucket. God's got a sense of humor. Okay, we, we sometimes fail to see that. But the son squandered everything his daddy had given him. I'm sure daddy probably told him, son, this is not the wisest choice. This is probably not the best option for you at this point in your life. Well, daddy, I'm tired of it. I'm out of here. I'm tired of living under your authority. I don't want to be here. Give me what is mine. Daddy said, okay, you know, there are times, there are times as parents, we have to finally, we, we, we raise our kids to turn them loose, right? We don't always turn them loose the way that we want to. But they get, they get to adulthood, they make choices, and we say, okay. Along with every choice, there comes a consequence or Consequence as, 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 right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But daddy turned him loose. Daddy turned him loose. He said, I hope you have a good life. And I have an idea there was a smirk in daddy's smile when he said that. But the boy went off, went to the city, wasted everything he had. And he was destitute. And when the famine came, he was really in trouble. He was really in trouble because not only had he spent everything he had, he had spent everything that would come to him. He didn't have a choice. He had to find a job. He was hurting. And he had put his focus on the wrong things, on the riotous living, right? And it cost him dearly, led him to a desperate place. As believers, we're to be kingdom seekers, displaying God's grace in our daily faith. This is why Solomon said, 
Give me neither riches nor poverty. Give me just enough for today. Now, that's not what we believe as Americans, right? That's not the American dream. But that's what God intends for us to believe. Give us enough for today. Give us today our daily bread. Now, is there anything wrong with saving for the future? No. God also taught that. Right? He taught us to save for the future so that we would have plenty for ourselves and we would have plenty to share with other people. All right? So it's not a, it's not a, well, God hates rich people. Not to, that's not it. God loves rich people, and God loves rich people who love him. God loves poor people. God loves poor people who love him. All right? And so there's a balance. It's like anything else. We've got to, we've got to read the whole sign to, to see what the sign says. God says, this is, this is one half of it. This is the other half. A lot of times we as believers don't want to follow God's word. We don't want to be bound by God's laws. We want to do it our way, like Frank Sinatra song. And then we bind ourselves up, just like the prodigal son did, bind ourselves up in, with things of the world. We spend everything we've got. We max out our credit cards. We borrow all the money we can. We take out a payday loan. We can't pay that back. And then we wonder, where's God? Well, he was providing for daily bread, but we wanted years out bread. And it creates problems. And so the boy was sitting in the pig lot sitting in the mud, fighting the pigs for the husks and the, and, the, and the pods that the pigs were eating. And he arrived at a reason. He arrived at reason. He began to think. He began to think. You know, this is dumb. This is dumb. I didn't live like this at my daddy's house. Now, he had a bunch of rules. He had me under his thumb. I didn't want to do all that mess. But it was better than this. At least I wasn't hungry. At least I wasn't stinking and dirty. At least I wasn't fighting pigs for my food. Isn't it sad that so many times it takes difficult circumstances in our lives to draw us back to our Heavenly Father? I, I don't know about you, but I can't tell you how many times I've painted myself into a corner, not physically when I'm painting the houses, but painted into a corner spiritually, painted into a corner physically. I've painted myself into a corner and said, what am I going to do now? What am I going to do now? And those difficult circumstances draw me back to Jesus. Draw me back to Jesus. Jesus said in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, He said, Don't worry saying, What am I going to eat? Or what am I going to drink? Or what am I going to wear? Because the pagan people run around after those things, and your Heavenly Father already knows you have need of them. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all of these other things will be added to you as well. Amen. Amen. God's got it all taken care of if we'll just listen, if we'll just pay attention and do it His way. The boy turned to reason. And he came up with a reasonable evaluation. I'm in a mess. He came up with a region, reasonable answer. A reasonable answer. I'll go home. He came up with a reasonable apology. 
Daddy, I've been wrong. And he came up with a reasonable alternative. Daddy, I, you've already given me everything that was supposed to be mine. I don't deserve anything else. Just make me one of your hired servants. <coughs> because you feed them and I am starving to death. I'm tired of eating out of the slop bucket. Well, reason came to him, and so he returned to become accountable to his daddy. Verse 20 says, he got up and went to his father. Let's go back to our opening quote, right? It's our self-importance, not our misery, that gets in God's way. Misery helps us see through our veil of self-importance, right? Misery helps us see through that veil of self-importance, and it teaches us a good dose of reality. And that reality is, I'm not near as important to other people as I think I am, right? And it doesn't matter where we, where we are this morning, whether we're I'm standing behind the pulpit, or as in Pastor Ronnie's service, I was sitting in the audience. I'm not as important as I think I am on either side of this, this desk, right? The only reason I'm important is because God has made me important in his kingdom. The only reason you're important is that God has made you important to his kingdom. It's not because of what you and I have done. It's not because of our great skills and gifts. It's because of what Jesus has done in us and what he's doing through us. But we're accountable for everything that, that we do. This broken young man climbed over the rails of the pig pen and headed home, fully willing to be one of his daddy's hired servants. He had learned humility. You know, most of us have learned humility at some point in our lives, back yonder. But as we age, we typically get less and less and less and less humble. Because we begin to think more of ourselves than we ought to think. We begin to feel like, I've got the right to say anything I want to, anytime I want to, to anybody that I want to. And that's not godly. That's not godly. I don't have the right to speak my mind just because I think my mind is better than somebody else's mind. It's wrong. It's sinful. It's prideful. There's no humility there. That's what the boy had done earlier with his daddy. Daddy, I'm tired of this mess. I want out. Give me what's mine. I don't like what you said. And I don't care if you don't like that I don't like it. You're going to know how I feel. And I've got the right to say it. No, we don't. No, we don't. We simply, simply don't. But the boy returned to humility. And, you know, as he, as he walked home, he probably sloshed off a little bit of the mud and stuff and in a creek as he was going through. But, you know, most creeks are not real clean to wash in. And even if you get rid of the mud, you can't get rid of the stink. All right? I don't know how many of you raised hogs, but we did. We did. And I loved to go out in the hog lot when Granddaddy was with me. Because he said, son, don't go out there by yourself. They will literally eat you alive. And there was a couple of times I was playing around the, the wallow, 
you know, we had a little pond out there. Granddaddy had, had you know, scraped up a berm with the tractor, and it was a hog wall, and it wasn't really a pond. There was a couple of times I was playing around out there, and I slid down in it. You know, accidentally on purpose. You know, you know how kids are. You did the same thing. And, you know, Granddaddy said, oh, boy, get all that, get all that mess off of you that you can. And I'll hose you off when we get back to the house. I'll hose you off. Maybe Mama won't see it. Well, walked into the house, and my mama said, Woo! Where have you been? And you know, I looked down, my legs were for the most part clean. And she said, have you been out in the hog lot again? Yes, ma'am, I have. Oh, you're going to have to take a bath where you have lunch. Get in there and scrub off. I know ain't scrubbed till I can't smell it anymore. I never did like baths. And I especially didn't like baths with water and soap, you know. And I'd scrub and scrub and she'd send me back. And so the boy did what he could, you know. He got off all the stink he could. But folks, nothing can take away the stink and the stench of our sin other than God's Holy Spirit detergent. It's only the blood of Jesus that can take away the stink and the stench of our sins. But the boy headed home to be accountable. Remember Solomon's, Solomon had a whole, he wrote a whole book of poems, right? And in, in chapter Chapter 16, verse 18, he said, be careful because pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. The boy had been filled with proud. He'd been filled with pride. He'd been filled with a haughty spirit. But now he's filled with humility. And he's heading home. Well, on the way home, he worked and worked and worked and worked on an apology. I imagine he rehearsed that, practiced that over and over and over and over. He had planned to say, Father, I've, ascend, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. And I imagine he practiced that, he rehearsed it, and he he. He'd add a word or two, and he'd take out a word or two. And he crafted that thing where it was, it was gonna, it was gonna sound just right. It was gonna sound sincere. He was gonna be as sincere as he knew how to be. And that was the first thing he was gonna say to his daddy. Because he was going home for acceptance and restoration. This is another accurate and true picture of God's agape love for you and me. Agape love that never stops. It never wanes. It never gets smaller. never lessens. It's God's unconditional love. But you see, this young boy's father was still looking he was still hoping and he was still praying that his wayward boy would come home. He hadn't given up hope. And one day, he is standing at the end of the driveway, looking down the road, and he saw somebody coming. And he probably prayed again, God, please let that be my boy. Please let that be my boy. And I don't know if the, if the son got close enough that daddy recognized the profile of his face. I don't know if he got close enough that daddy recognized the, you know, the, the way the boy walked, his gait, 
You know, every one of us walks a little bit differently. But he got close enough that daddy realized, that's my boy! That's my boy! He's coming home! And the scripture tells us he ran to his son, fell on his son's neck and hugged him and kissed him. And the boy started into his speech and he said, Father, I've sinned against heaven. And he, oh, come on, come on, come on home. Y'all, come on. Go get that fatted, fatted calf. Let's have a party. My boy's home. My boy's home. My boy's home. He didn't even get to finish his speech. He didn't even get to finish his speech. All my brothers and sisters, if you've been the prodigal, and you've been welcomed home like that. There's nothing in the world like it. But if you've been the parent. And the prodigal has come back home. That's even better. That's even better. And all my brothers and sisters. Every one of us. Just like we talked last week. We're all sinners. It's just some of us fall more deeply into sin than others. We're all prodigals. It's just how far away we've wandered. It depends on, you know, how much of that fortune we've wasted. But our Heavenly Father is waiting for you and me to come home. He's waiting for you and me to come home. We're still in Luke 15. Look back up at verse 7 that we talked about three Sundays ago. I tell you that in the same way there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need to repent. God. God knows how far away you are this morning. You know how far away you are this morning. And God as our Heavenly Father is waiting to restore us. I gave a quote a couple of weeks ago from, by John Newton. Told you he had been a slave trader and got saved. I'll give you a little more detail on that this morning and then we'll close with another quote from him. John Newton went to sea at a very young age, worked on a slave ship in a slave trade. In 1745, he himself, as a slave trader, was captured and sold to Princess Paye, a woman of the Chevro people in what's now Sierra Leone in Africa. After a while, he was rescued and he went back to sea, back to the slave trade, and became very successful, became the captain of several slave ships. Even after he retired from, from the slave ships, he continued to invest in the slave trade. But somebody shared the gospel with John Newton. And he got saved. And when John Newton got Jesus, Jesus got all there was of John Newton. God called that former slave trader to be a pastor. And for the next 20 years, he was a parish priest. He was a prodigal. He experienced God bringing him back into the fold, bringing him to salvation. He wrote a lot of songs, a lot of hymns. Two that we're very familiar with in our church are 
glorious things of thee are spoken. Right? That's a very familiar hymn. And then John Newton, the slave trainer, also wrote Amazing Grace. Because he had experienced that grace firsthand. Firsthand. John Newton wrote these words about this passage. We cannot be safe or happy until we are weaned from our own will. Although we understand this, we seldom learn without being trained for a while in the school of disappointment. Anybody else been in class with me? I, I figured somebody had. We judge things, John Newton said, we judge things by their present appearance, but the Lord sees them in their consequences. And it's one of God's heaviest judgments when he gives any person up, gives any person up to the way of his own heart and allows them to walk according to their own wisdom. You see, folks, We're not as wise as we think we are. God created us that way so that we would seek his wisdom. Solomon wrote a whole book on that, right? John tells us, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally, freely, and he doesn't scold us for asking that for that wisdom. Just like the prodigal son ran out of money, it doesn't take us long to run out of wisdom. But when the boy came home, Daddy restored him to full sonship. Full forgiveness, full grace, full love. And our God will do the same thing. Our application today is kind of a play on words. Goes into our invitation hymn. Have thine own way, Lord. Often starts with have my own way. Right? I'm out of here. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of all the rules. I'm tired of all the regulations. I want out. I want to have my own way. But in order for God to have his own way, my way has to die. Where are you this morning? Where are you this morning? How far into, into prodigality are you? How far have you drifted from God just this week? Any far is too far. Any far is too far. God's saying, come on home. Come on home. Let's make it right. Let's make it right. Let's stand and sing together. This is a prayer. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. You're the potter. I'm the clay. Let's stand and sing. If we can pray with you, please allow us to. Have I obey? right where 
you were when we walked away. Thank you for that confidence. Thank you for that gift. Thank you for the privilege of coming home and saying, Father, I have been wrong. Forgive me. Make me one of your hired servants. And yet you wrap us up in your big old loving arms, hug us up tight, and you say, welcome home, my child. Thank you. Lord, don't let us presume on your grace. But God, let us participate in it for your honor and your glory. Give us safety as we go home now. Lord, give us a profitable week for your kingdom. May you allow every one of us to spend time daily in your word. Spend time daily in prayer. Spend time somewhere between now and next Sunday sharing the gospel with somebody. Who do we know, Lord, that, that might be another John Newton? We might win the next Billy Graham to Christ this week just simply because we were obedient to what you said. Teach us to die to our own way and have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name we ask. I love you. Thank you for coming this morning. I hope you worshiped.